like, man, I, I came and I was like, nah, I think Brother Jason needs to be preaching. <laughs> Jeez, oh, Andre. I mean, you know, that, that's, that's what we're all about, you know? Um, amen. Spirit of excellence. Thank God for um, I'm really, really privileged to be here. Um, being home at Tottenham is is like nothing else. And um, just uh, come give you good reports. We we have um, at the church where we're, we're there, we're pioneering, we're working with with folks. Um, and when we feel your prayers, um, I was told the other day that you guys were, were well, I know every, what's it called? Monday fasting, Monday prayer, power Monday, Friday. At prayer and you guys are always praying um for us and, and and it's really encouraging it honestly to the soul is really encouraging and you almost feel like you know what we're gonna take the world and then you know um so please just continue praying for us uh we're gonna see all that god wants to do amen you know jeez uh the bible teaches us that when it comes to god's presence it's not a case of God's presence just coming down to us, but in fact, it's about us walking into his presence. It, it explains it in a way that there are gates and we ought to walk into God's presence through those gates with thanksgiving and with praise. Um, that's not my sermon tonight. I just felt in, in prayer to, to mention that. And I want to ask one thing. I know I've never probably done this before or, or do again, but I want to ask us if we can just take a moment right now. We're going to say, God, tonight we're coming to things, coming into your presence. Um, my flesh, irrespective of what day I've had, my manager was at this, my colleague did that again, this person, what, whatever type of day we've had, coming into your presence, flesh, you're going to be obedient in God's presence. And number two, we're going to give the devil notice, you're not having your way tonight. So can I ask if we could all just stand to our feet? And that's what we're going to pray. We're going to take dominion. And we're going to say we are entering into God's presence right now. Pray with me, church. Lord, we come before you. We take dominion tonight. And we say to our flesh that you will yield yourself to the purposes of God that Jesus, you are all that we ever need. You are all that we ever want, God. And we're here tonight to give notice to the devil that your word will, be, will call forth, that our hearts will be challenged, that our spirits would be changed, that God, you would have your way tonight. Hallelujah. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Please find your seats tonight. Um, if you can turn with me to the book of Genesis, chapter 35, the book of Genesis, chapter 35, and we're going to read that in a moment. But I wanted to ask a question tonight. It's the old age old question. If you ever um, had gone through your GCS, if you ever attended your psychology classes or your philosophy classes, um, or you ever studied it, it's the age old question, why am I here? What is my purpose? So I'm asking you tonight, why are you here on this earth? What is your purpose in life? Why did God create you? Why are you here on this earth? What is the very essence of you being on this planet? What difference do you make? Many times people who are about to commit suicide think, I make no difference. We, we probably heard on the news today, um, an Irish lady in Dubai or Saudi Arabia, one of them um, was arrested for about to commit suicide. <clears throat> And now the whole of the Tayosich, forgive me if you're Irish, um, Irish prime minister has gotten involved and has basically said, no, we are going to fight for her to be released. Somebody who was about to commit suicide gets arrested for it, thinking there is no purpose, there's no point to my life. Who would even notice 
a whole nation, a whole country in Ireland is standing up for her rights to be flown back to um, to Ireland and to receive treatment and so on and so forth. What purpose do you serve on this planet? What was the reason why you were born? There's a story in the Bible which talks about a young girl who dreamt like many young girls of being a princess. And that dream came true. And in one moment of that, re of that dream, she realized there was a purpose of God behind her being, becoming a princess, becoming a queen. We're about to read in our text today about a young man who had purpose in his life. The Bible, even before he is born, there is a promise that is being given to him. There is a promise that is being given to his family. And we're going to read tonight what his purpose was. But my first question tonight is, what is your purpose? If you were to go back, I know some of you, 40, someone just hit the... the 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 nice the nice old the nice young age you know what i mean halfway there if you were to go back in my case 24 years to when you were born what was god thinking when he formed you what was god thinking about what was going through his mind as he was creating you in your mother's womb here in our text, we're going to read from Genesis 35 about a young man who received a promise. Not only he received a promise, but his father received a promise, and even his grandfather received a promise as well. Genesis chapter 35, uh, reading from verse 9. Then God appeared to Jacob again when he came from Padan Aram and blessed him. And God said to him, your name is Jacob. Your name shall not be called Jacob anymore, but Israel shall be your name. So he called his name Israel. Also, God said to him, I am God Almighty, be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall proceed from you, and kings shall come from your body. The land which I gave Abraham and Isaac I give to you. And to your descendants, after you, I give this land. Then God went up from, from him in the place where he talked with him. So Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he talked with him, a pillar of stone, and he poured a drink offering on it, and he poured oil on it. And Jacob called the name of the place where God spoke with him, Bethel, i.e. the house of God. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we ask you tonight that your word would go forth, God, and not return void, Lord. We're praying that by your Holy Spirit, you would minister into the hearts of your people tonight, God. Let there be a challenge, Father God, that goes forth. And we thank you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Jacob was born for a purpose. Now, I don't know about you, but I thought to myself, I've heard from God about my purpose in life. I wonder, I wonder, I wonder if my dad ever had heard from God. My dad passed away when I was 16. Um, I can't ask him. I never knew my father's side of, what do you call it, the tree or the line or the side of family. Um, I only knew my mother's side of the family. So when I think about grandparents, I've never even seen my father's parents. I've never even heard, I don't even know their name, but I know everything on, on my mother's side. Well, not everything, but I know most things on my mother's side. And so when I think about my grandfather, Solomon Frederick Goodhead, don't Google it. I wonder to myself, did he ever receive a promise from God? Did God ever once speak to granddad and ever speak a word over his life, speak a word of promise and purpose and destiny in generations to come? I wonder, 
I wonder. I wonder for you tonight, church, has God ever spoken to maybe perhaps your father or your grandfather, mother or father's side, and spoken a word of promise, a word of encouragement, a word of blessing, a word of inheritance over your grandfather or your father? In our text, we've just read, we have Jacob. Jacob, his name means fraudster, a swindler, uh, somebody who you've always, you've got to kind of keep your purse, your wallet, just check, yeah, wallet's still there, and um, Jacob just left. And here he receives a word from God where God is speaking to Jacob and he is saying to him, Jacob, I've got purpose for your life. I've got destiny for your life. You weren't just born for no reason. You're not just here by mistake. Yes, your mom and your dad, they may have, they weren't expecting you. But Jacob, I created you with a purpose. And the purpose I've created you for has a lot to do with who your father is. Because I promised your father that I was going to give him a land for an inheritance. Even more so than your father, I promised your grandfather, Jacob, that I was going to make him one single man to become a nation. Jacob, my promise is still true in your life today. And I'm here to declare, church, that you were created for a purpose. You were created with a specific task at hand. When you were in your mother's womb and God was forming you, I wonder what was he thinking of 40 years down the road? What was he thinking of you as he was forming you and, and, and making sure that the, the, the right, I'm not going to use the terms, but the right soldier meets meets the right one god had to make sure no no, no I, I don't want that one i want i want i want that specific one to meet and and join because that specific one out of the million yeah you you got your dad's charm there and that specific one that's released yeah, you've got your mom's your mom's personality. She can fight, and and I want these two specifically to be joined. And voila, you are here. I wonder, have you ever considered, church, if God goes to that much detail, then surely what was He thinking about me as I was being conceived, as I was being formed? What is your purpose? What is your destiny? What is it that God has for you today? Young girl dreaming to be a princess one day gets the opportunity and becomes queen. And in the time of being queen, her people, her nation is about to be destroyed. And her uncle comes up to her, Esther 414. We got that one. And her uncle comes up to her and he says the famous words that we all know and we all adhere to. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise from, for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. Yet... Who knows, Esther? Who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this? When God was forming you in your mother's womb, what did he what was he thinking about you in 2024? What was he thinking about you for 2023 or 2025? Because God being almighty. He had thoughts about you in 2024, where you were going to be in life, what he expected from you, what he had designed and created you for. 
there is a young man who was struggling in confidence with God. God had spoken to him, this is what I've called you to do, young man. This is what I've called you to become. I need you to take my words, go to your people and tell them my very words that I speak to them. And the young man is wrestling. He's wrestling. He's, 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 he's lacking a bit of confidence to deliver God's word. He's worried um, for himself. He's worried about his safety. You know, just like we, we hear about the young man who went to Tenerife and then all of a sudden he's gone missing. Um, there's a report that in the last week, a lot of his very close friends have left the island of Tenerife and have come back to the United Kingdom, fearing for their safety because they've received death threats to say, if you continue searching for your friend, this is what we're going to do. In fact, a video was shown of the airport, the airport in Tenerife, saying we're waiting for you. That was me. What's the last flight? You know what? Forget the flight. I'm taking the boat to the next island. This young man is, is in fear for his safety. If I say what I'm going to say, what would happen to me? What would my peers think? What would my friends think? I may, my life may even be in danger. And God doesn't come to him and say, listen, don't worry. I'm, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to protect you. God comes to him in Jeremiah 1.5. We show that. And he says some, some specific words. He says to him, when it comes to me and you, Jeremiah, I want you to know that I know you that I know you deep. There's many people we've known for five years and great, they're friends, they've joined our thing, you know, our circle and so on. But God is telling him, not only do I know you, I know your mother and I know your father. And he says, before I formed you in the womb, Jeremiah, I knew you. Before soldier and released, ever met I knew who you were already Jeremiah before you were born I had sanctified you I had set you apart for a specific purpose I ordained you a prophet to the nations Jeremiah is thinking goodness gracious me if I say this what's my village gonna think and God is telling him you're worried about a village but I've got nations for you to go and speak this word. I'm asking tonight, church, what is it that God has for your life? What is his purpose? Some of us weren't born in this country. Some of us were born and traveled. And we're here today. God, what purpose did you have for me? Did you know God? that 40 years, 20 years, 30, 40, 50 years down the road, I would be where I am today. And I submit to you, church, God knew it all along. What could he see when he was creating you? What was it that God had in store for you that if you don't accomplish, it wouldn't be done? What is that purpose? Do you know it? Has God ever spoken to you and said, my daughter, this is my purpose for you. My son, this is what I'm calling for you. Because in our text, we meet this young man, Jacob, and he's been told, my son, this is my purpose that I have for you. But his life is not a perfect life. His life is a family with problems. And I know there's many people here from different families. I mean, no, there's no perfect family. Jacob's family is a family with problems. In fact, it started from birth. He was a twin. And as he's been, as his older brother is being born, Jacob is there holding his leg. Tenno, it's supposed to be me first. So from birth, 
there are already issues in the family. How many know there's even more issues when you have parents who have favorites in the home? Oh, Esau, man, look at you, man. You're like a man's man. Oh, you partake of... Oh, boy, you look like me when you smile. There's problems in a family when parents have their favorites. Right from the very beginning to the point, we all know the story that Jacob is convinced by his mother to lie to his father and to defraud his brother. Jacob has to run for his life. And now so much problems and troubles come upon him. This is Jacob whose promise has been given to him. Even as they were being born and Rebecca was giving birth, the Bible tells us that the older will serve the younger. So I, I don't know about you, but did your mom ever tell you that you got a word as you were being born? I think Paul's put his hand up. No, just scratch it. All right. Here, Jacob has received this word. His life is not perfect. He causes problems for himself. Anyone here ever caused problem for yourself? You ever said some? You ever said something you shouldn't have said? You ever did something you shouldn't have done? Ever gone somewhere you shouldn't have gone? And then all of a sudden, there's more problems than you ever imagined. Jacob has got problems after problems that he's caused for himself. He has to run from his home. Anyone here ever run from home? He has to run from home because his brother is going to kill him. He's lied to his dad and his dad could pronounce a curse on him. And so he runs from his home and he runs to his mother's brother's ho home. With his um, uncle Laban, he works 17 years. He sees... This is Bible time before the law. But he sees... Uh, Rachel? All right. Somebody read it this morning. He sees Rachel. He wants to get married. He works seven years for her. Marriage consummation. Wakes up in the morning. And it's Leah. You swindled me, uncle. He says, look, work for me another seven years. He works another seven years. He gets Rachel. He gets his wife that he always wanted. Now, you would think things will get better. But how many know there's a problem, number one, if a man has two wives? And then there's a bigger problem if the man favors one wife over the other. Jacob is now working for his uncle 14 years. And then another seven years, to almost 21 years, Jacob is working for his uncle. He leaves his uncle's home. He has a bit of bad blood with his uncle. He leaves his uncle's home. And now he's going back to his father's house. God speaks to him. He meets with him, um, speaks to him. Jacob now has children. And how many know problems begets problems Jacob's children 12 sons in particular and one daughter his eldest son I mean who's watched EastEnders recently sorry for you um Hollyoaks home and away EastEnders all in one Dallas who remembers Dallas all right all in one show in Jacob's family. His eldest son, Reuben, it's a grown man now, ends up sleeping with his father's wife. So Reuben's half-brother, Dan and Naphtali, he ends up sleeping with their mother. Some weird fixing is going on. And Jacob smacks Reuben on the hand and tells him off and gives pronounces a curse on him. That's as much as he does. How many know if you're Dan and Naphtali? So when I grow up, it's all right. The other day, um, there was a young, when I was much younger, I remember I was crossing the road to go to the corner shop when I lived just opposite Tottenham Green. 
and I'm crossing to go get a sweet. And then this big guy um comes over, stops, and he goes, Yo, brother, hold on, you're right. And I'm like, Oh, fine, thank you. Um, and he goes, Yeah, let me have 10 pounds. And then me like a fool. Oh, I'm looking for the oh, I don't have 10 pounds. He goes, What do you mean you ain't got 10 pounds, man? And he started, you know, comes a little bit closer, and I'm like, much bigger than me. I'm small. I know, I know it doesn't look about I was a bit chubbier then. Um and then thankfully one of my elder elder cousins was just looked out the window that ran in time and saw this guy he doesn't know talking to me and he came and goes, Yo, Idris, you all right? Nah, I'm like <laughs> And then after the guy spots me and then he goes off. Well, guess what? I grew up and just about two weeks ago, who do I see walking into Tottenham Green? Walking into, sorry, let me finish. Walking into Tottenham Green Leisure Centre, and now he's a bit of an older guy, and he's got his little daughter. And I say, you have no, and I know his name, David. <laughs> he can't remember me, but oh, I'll never forget your face. And here's your daughter. I could, I mean, I would never do that, but <laughs> like, you're taking your daughter karate. I could deal with you. But thank God I'm saved. You're lucky. Reuben, imagine Dan and Naftali. You did this to my mom. You shamed my mother. When I get older, when I get bigger, and we'll come back to Dan specifically. That's Reuben, eldest son. Jacob's only daughter is named Dina or Dinah. She is working uh, with her father and her brothers near the, the city of Shechem. Um, they go into the city, they trade their animals, their livestock, they come back out of the city. They're living outside of the city um, whilst the people of Shechem are living inside of the city. But one day, Dina or Diner is there and she's working and she's selling. You know, the other day I, I had a bit of an example or, or experience of, of trying to do selling and I thank God for Joseph who came to rescue me. Um, at a school summer fair because a rush of people came to me suddenly and I froze. My brain froze. I, I knew the price was one pound and that's three pound 50 or three pound and that's 30p. So three pound 30. Just give me the exact change. What's your problem? Why are you giving me 10 pound note for? So I'm trying to calculate what's going on And I'm looking at Joseph, and he's like, just, just give them uh, six pound, six pound seventy. <laughs> Dina is in the marketplace, and she's there, and she's transacting business with her brothers, with her father. And one day, a group of girls are walking by, and they're like, hey, you're pretty. She goes, oh, thank you. Just my rags. And they're like, hey, why don't you come out with us? Why are we going to the town square? We're gonna go, we're gonna go cinema. We're gonna do, we're gonna go to PAX and buy lip gloss. And she's like, no, I can't, I've, I've got to work. The next day, there is no work. It's a Saturday, it's a high day for the Jews. And she decides, the Bible says, to go into the city to meet the girls of the city. And so she leaves her father's house and goes into the city to be with the girls of the city. And the Bible says that in that very one day and one moment, the prince of the city, his name was Shechem, he was so spoiled that his dad named the city after him, sees Dina, takes her by force, rapes her, and then keeps her bound in his home. The brothers are, where, are my, where is my sister? Jacob's life is going from problem to problem to problem. The bro his, um, her brothers, um, Reuben and Levi, Simeon and Levi, um, plot something up and they end up killing all the men of the city. So Jacob behind him has got problems with Laban, his uncle. He's running away from, he's running, he's going back home and his brother Esau, he assumes, is, is wanting to kill him. Now where he is staying temporarily, the worst has happened to his daughter. 
and his sons have just gone and murdered all the men of the city. Tomorrow, when the other cities and villages come to do trade and realize everything's been stolen and burnt, who are they going to look for? Me. Jacob's problems are going from worse to worse. He has a son, and his son's name is Judah. Judah has children, and unfortunately, you know, uh, his sons pass away. But he, in a low point of his life, he goes and sleeps with a prostitute, not knowing that the woman he slept with was actually the wife of his first son. It is going getting from worse to weird to just Jacob's life is not perfect. Can I, I said all of that to say this, it is possible that you have had a promise from God. It is possible that God could have spoken over your life, even at birth, to your father, to your grandfather, and your life still not be perfect. Jacob and his family are in this position because they've lost sight of God's promises. Jacob, you didn't have to swindle your brother. Just trust God and he will work it all out. But he took matters into his own hand and he's lost sight. You know, it's possible, church, that if God has spoken to you and you have lost sight of what God had said to you, what God has shown you about your life, you can begin to make decisions. You can begin to live in places you know you shouldn't live. You can begin to go and see people and, and try to meet up with people you have no business meeting with. You can begin to do things that are going to take you down the wrong road. You begin to do things that you would never have done when God first spoke to you. Over a passage of time, Jacob's life and his family's life is going from worse to worse. What God has spoken to you, church, you have to cling on to. You're going to have to hold on to. The Bible even says it like this. It says, write the vision down. Write it down, whether pen and paper, whether on your mobile phone, on a device, whatever it is, God says, write what I have shown you down. What I've spoken to you in the secret place, when you cried out to me, write it down. Because if you don't write it down and you forget and you think, well, what's the point? What difference would it make if I ended my life? What difference would it make if I didn't turn up? What difference would it make if I wasn't involved? And before you know it, your life goes down certain roads that you never expected. Some of us have come into the kingdom of God because our life was headed down certain roads that we had no control of taking back. And so we called out to God. You know, it's possible to be part of a family that has a purpose, that has the call of God, and you yourself in that family are not walking aligned. It's, it's amazing you can have the same parents with a number of children and almost every single child is different, got their own personality and so forth. Just the same way Jacob and his family had these problems, you know, it's possible that you are in a church, a church that has promise, a, a church that has vision, a church that has purpose, a church that God had spoken to your father, to your grandfather, your spiritual father, your spiritual grandfather, and you could be in the church but yet your life is not under the flow and the blessing of that family or of that church. If God has saved you here in this church, there is a promise that has been given to your forefathers, to our founder, Pastor Wayman Mitchell. And that was to go into all the world and make disciples. That was for world evangelism going outside of our borders, our national borders, to reach other people. 
You know, if you're part of this family, if you're part of this church family, this has to be in your DNA. Because if you're not, if it's not in your DNA, then you could ha be sitting under the church, but you don't have the flow and the blessing from God upon you. Your life could be going spiraling out of control while you're sitting in church because the vision has been lost. Discipleship, reaching out to others, people who maybe perhaps are not like you. There's a, there's a gentleman that I'm um, trying to work with and, and, and so forth. I believe Pastor mentioned his name, Diego. Diego is nothing like me. I'm English. He's Brazilian. I'll leave it there. Nothing like me whatsoever. But my purpose is to reach out to him, find out what kind of, so what kind of food do you like? What? How about fish and chips? Try that out. Yeah, let's meet in the middle. Reaching out, spending your own money to reach out to somebody to build a connection and a relationship so that they can begin to ask you questions and they can begin to observe your life. Discipleship is about bringing somebody who is outside into your life so that they can see how you live. They can see how you react to situations. They can see the things you would say and the things you would never say so that they can observe you. That is what discipleship is. And if we don't have that in our DNA, if we're not reaching out to somebody else to bring them in, to observe our lives so that we can impart to them, then we may be sitting in the church, but we don't have the flow and blessing coming down from top to bottom. Outreach. That is another one of our DNA as a church, to reaching out to people who are outside of our four walls. To say, you know what, God, I, I, I need to reach out to people. Oh, no, I work, though. I work. I've got a shift. Yeah, I know, I know, I know Giles sent the message, but I've got a shift um, that day. Outreach isn't just meant to be when the church says there's outreach. It could be at work. Where you work right now, I've had a revelation. Where you work right now, many times God has a purpose with somebody there. And you got to pray and say, God, what is it you want me to do? Who is it you want me to impact? It doesn't mean you got to stand on the table and start preaching and so forth. But who is there that I can impact? The children in closing, the children of Israel, 400 years later, after God had spoken to Jacob, They've been enslaved in Egypt. Um, we know the story. Joseph has set them free um, and taken them to the land of Goshen. Now, God says, God sends Moses. He releases them. They're no longer slaves, slaves for 400 years. And he releases them. Pharaoh releases them through Moses. And now they get 40 years later to the promised land. My goodness me. God's promise to Abraham, I will make you into a nation. Now there's about a million of them, but they are slaves. How could God's promises still be true? They are set free, and now they're about to cross over the River Jordan into the promised land, and guess what? Nine out of the tribes settle on the west side of the river Jordan, have entered into God's promise, have entered into the destiny that God has for them, that have entered into the promises that God had ordained, that God had spoken four, five hundred years before to their great grandfather, their greatest grandfather, Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob. Finally, they stepped into their promised land and two tribes decide we're not going to cross over. We're going to stay on this side. Now, I've said that to say this. It is possible that God has spoken to you, that you have a purpose God has given you, but you settled on the east side of the Jordan River. You know what the word Jordan means? And anyone here named Jordan? Good. The word Jordan means to go downstream. It means to go downward, the word Jordan. The river Jordan, where the word Jordan comes from, 
was a river that would flow down southwards, go downwards to the Dead Sea. Here in our text, two tribes, Dan and Reuben, Dan, Reuben is, was the eldest. Dan would have been the half-brother that Reuben had slept with the mother and so forth. Decide to stay on this side of the river, Jordan, going downwards. And then further down the line for them, they end up being one of the first tribes to be wiped out for the Israelite people. When you settle for less than what God has for you, hear me, church, when you settle for less than what God has for you, you are staying on the east side of the River Jordan. And the only way you're going is downwards. You have got to cross over. You have got to make the effort to cross over into the promised land and gain dominion in the promised land, the promises that God has for you. You have got to cross over. Because the children of Israel, two tribes had settled. There's people here, some of you have settled in your jobs. Uh, you know what? I'm good. You know the problem with slaves? They can be a slave. They can be set free physically, but they still have their mindset, slave mindset. No, I'm fine. I'm, uh, yeah, I just, I just put up, yeah, I've got a few tins and I put up this shack. I'm fine. No, you've been free from the Egyptians. You don't have to live in a shack no more. You've been free. You can build your own house. You know how to construct the clay. You were doing it for 400 years. You know how to do I know, but like, I'm happy with this. I'm happy with what... That's the problem with slaves, with slavery, with a slavery mindset. The problem with poverty is that people who were... Perhaps, you know, they have different class systems. They've got lower class, they've got working class, they've got middle class. People who were an, on a lower level in life have now been saved and God wants to take them to next levels in their life. They get to working class. They've got a job. Things are, are okay. They can manage things now. And then you settle. Settle in a job. I was in the NHS. And when I first started, I would go up to people, they would come introduce me. I'm like, oh, hi, you're the, yeah, yeah, I'm just um, working in this department. Oh, how long have you been here? Just two weeks. How long have you been here? 20 years. While I was still drinking milk, you were working here. And what did you start, uh, start as? Oh, you know, I was, I've always been helping. I've always been in this department doing this particular job. And you never moved. Settled. People settled in their finances. You know what? I'm, I'm earning enough money. I can go and I can come. I can travel and I can stay. I'm okay where I am. I, I don't need to try anymore. You're settling on the east side of the River Jordan when there is milk and honey on the other side for you. And all it requires is for you to take up a book and study more. Take up a book, learn some new skills and begin to have dominion in the land flowing with milk and honey. But you can settle where you are. Can I tell you what happens to people who settle? They go down the Jordan River. We can settle in our education. We can settle in our ministries. Oh, well, I know how to do the thing, so I don't need to try anymore. I, I've always been doing it this way. I've always been doing it that way. And we just settle where we are. Do you know what happens to a church that settles? Do you know what happens to a ministry that settles? It goes down the Jordan River. In your finances. And oh, this is, yeah, man, what? I never... I thank God, and just in closing, the job that I um, that I do, I have a student, and my student just yes, it was today, Wednesday, yesterday, got their results after eighteen months of being in an apprenticeship, and they got a distinction, and I was so happy. Why was I so happy for this particular student? Because 
I forgot what the term is called, but they believed they were a senior information manager in the NHS and they believed that they were a fraud. That, oh my gosh, like I, I don't actually know what I should know. I was employed to do this job, but I don't actually know. I don't have the right skills for it. And one day somebody's going to find out. Ever felt like that? Imposter syndrome. I felt like that many times. And they were, they, they were struggling and they would tell me that. And then at the end of it all, 18 months later, they finished their apprenticeship and they got themselves a distinction. In my email to them congratulating them, I said, you smashed the apprenticeship but you conquered yourself. There's people here today. Have you settled on the east side of the River Jordan? Are you, please, 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 please don't be that person. Somebody asks you and says, oh, so how, how long have you been here? Oh, I've been here before you were born. Don't be that person. Be moving, be shaking, whether in your finances, where you are today, church, where you are right now in your spiritual walk with God, in your finances, in your education, in your ministry, that is not the promised land. God has much more for you and you ought to step out and you ought to challenge yourself. Do what is necessary. You know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to learn how to read the music sheets. I'm going to learn how to play like this professional. I'm going to set myself challenges so that this time next year, or in a few years time, I'm in a much better position than I am today. Because God has so much more for you. Don't settle for where you are now. There is so much ahead for you. It doesn't matter what age you are. It doesn't matter your background, what's happened yesterday. If you look to God, the answer is to seek first the kingdom of heaven. Seek God in all things. Find out God's will for your life. God, what do you have for me? What is it you have set me apart for? Why was I born? Why was I born again? God, what is my purpose in this world? And can I say this in closing? The issue is not, will God speak to me? Will God show me? The issue will always be, will I obey? God will speak. God will show. Don't worry about that. Just worry about whether you will obey. And with that, I want to ask for every head bowed and every eye closed in this place. In you alone, I am complete. For you hold my destiny. We're here today, church, and perhaps you're not right with God. You know in your hearts you're not saved, you're not born again. But tonight, you want to make a decision. You want to say, you know what, God, if you have something for me, if you have a purpose for me, God, I want to enter into that purpose. Then you would lift up your hand. We'll see that and we'll gladly pray with you. You're not saved. You're not born again. You're not right with God. Or maybe perhaps you're, you settled on the east of Jordan, and you've gone downstream, and you've gone away from the things of God. But tonight you want to say that, I want to come back. I want to come back to the things of God. Then you lift up your hand, and we will gladly lead you to prayer. Speaking to the church tonight, church, let's not settle for where we are. God has so much more for us. Let's not just settle spiritually. Oh, I've read my Bible a few times. Oh, I've I've had this experience in 19 Father Abraham. Oh, this happened in the past. God, I want to tell you, God is not a monument. He's a movement. And we need to move with God. Our relationship with God should be growing and should be getting stronger. And there are times... It goes downhill, but we pick it up again. And we say, God, I'm gonna, I'm gonna come and seek your face. Prayer, morning prayer. I was driving this morning and I saw someone coming out of morning prayer this morning. And I was like, praise God. Thank God that there are folk that still will make morning prayer their priority to seek your face. 
when I'm traveling and I see people coming out of church or um, outreaching, I'm like, thank God there are still people who have not settled, who have not gone down the slavery mindset or the poverty mindset and said, I can handle this, this I'm alright with. God has so much more for you. Jeremiah was worrying about a village and a few friends. God says, I've anointed you to be a prophet to the nations. What you worry about, God says, I have so much more for you. And tonight we're going to open up these altars. And these altars are open. And I want to encourage you, church. Come forward, let's come, and let's pray. Ask God, but what's my purpose? Oh, God. What do you have for me, Lord?